on World News Tonight. Slums spurt. India's billionaire Gautam Adani causes concerns among the less fortunate with a new development project. Climate chaos. Tropical storm Idalia bears down on Cuba, leaving destruction in its wake. Trump in trouble. Donald Trump's ratings drop following the GOP debates in the midst of securing his DC trial dates. And Maasai memories. Kenya's Narok sees a celebration of cultures at their cultural festival. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are joining us on World News. Now we begin tonight in neighboring India as residents of Dharavi, India's largest slum, are worried about a new development project headed up by billionaire Gautam Adani, one that might see thousands of residents displaced. The Dharavi slum in India's Mumbai is home to one million people, making it one of the world's biggest. It has a complicated history dating back to the 1800s. Now a plan to overhaul the area is causing residents to get jittery about what the future holds and where they fit into it. You might recognize Dara V from the Oscar-winning movie Slumdog Millionaire. The slum is known for producing leather goods and many residents run small businesses out of their homes. At the helm of plans to redevelop Dharavi into a modern city hub are Indian billionaire Gautam Adani and the Adani Group. In July, the state government approved his $614 million contract bid to overhaul the slum after years of failed attempts. The Adani Group says it will demolish what it describes in legal documents as an area of unhygienic, deplorable conditions and build new towers on state-owned land to accommodate residents and their businesses. Adani stands to make billions from the project. Residents worry the redevelopment will take away their livelihoods. We also want to live in a bigger house. However, we are scared that the tailoring business we are running here, whether it will be able to grow or not. The overhaul will come with free homes, but only for those who lived here before 2000. About 700,000 residents are considered ineligible and will be offered units up to six miles away. That could require them to pay upfront costs or higher rents. The project comes at a tumultuous time for Adani, who has acknowledged the project presents colossal challenges. He was considered the world's third richest person until January, when allegations by a U.S. short seller of improper dealings wiped $150 billion off his group's market valuations. In interviews with some Dara V residents said the billionaire's financial troubles contributed to their mistrust, with some wondering where they would go if the project fell apart. A fresh threat to the project is a legal challenge from rival bidder Seclink Technologies Corporation. It alleges that an original 2018 tender was improperly cancelled and restarted with new terms last year so that Adani could win, according to court papers reviewed. The current state government and Adani are contesting the case. Meanwhile, Washington and Beijing are working to sort out their persisting conflicts like trade issues, this time by laying out a working group and communication channels. The United States and China have agreed to set up new channels of communication in an effort to bolster their economic relationship. During a four-hour meeting on Monday, U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo and her Chinese counterpart Wang Wentao agreed to form a working group to solve trade and investment issues as well as advance U.S. commercial interests in China. The working group will hold vice ministerial meetings twice a year, with the first meeting to be held early next year in the U.S. The U.S. and China also agreed to a government information exchange that will serve as a platform to discuss export control issues. The first in-person meeting will be held on Tuesday in Beijing. Raimondo emphasized that the information exchange will be for sharing more information about U.S. export restrictions on advanced technology and that the U.S. will not be compromising or negotiating on issues such as national security. There will also be regular communication on the secretarial or ministerial level with meetings to take place at least annually. 
These negotiations are part of the Biden administration's recent efforts to ease tensions between the two countries. Raimondo is the latest to visit China after other senior U.S. officials such as Secretary of State Antony J. Blinken, Treasury Secretary Janet L. Yellen and the President's climate envoy John Kerry. Raimondo emphasized the importance of stable economic relations between the two nations. As you well know, our teams have worked over the summer to establish uh, new information on this point. We seek healthy competition with China. Wang responded by saying that China is ready to make efforts to strengthen cooperation between U.S. and Chinese companies. Raimondo is scheduled to meet other key Chinese officials during the rest of the four-day visit that will end on August 30th, and those meetings are expected to continue to focus on trade and transparency to improve ties between the world's top two economies. A weather alert now as forecasters were closely watching tropical storm Idalia as it passed Cuba and headed towards exceptionally warm waters in the Gulf of Mexico. The storm was on track to intensify rapidly before making landfall on the Florida panhandle, possibly as a major hurricane. Tropical storm Idalia was expected to strengthen into a major hurricane before making landfall on Florida's Gulf Coast on Tuesday, according to the National Hurricane Center. The storm churned past western Cuba on Monday, giving Americans a preview of what's to come. Homes were flooded in towns south of Havana, and thousands of people were evacuated. Satellite animations show the storm's growing intensity, its current northerly track, put some 14 million Floridians under hurricane and tropical storm warnings. National Hurricane Center Director Michael Brennan. And this is an area that we're highlighting the uh, danger of life-threatening inundation from storm surge. So the, the circulation of Adalia is going to push water from the Gulf of Mexico up into places like Charlotte Harbor, Tampa Bay, in the Big Bend region where the, the storm surge is, is very, very sensitive here. Floridians were seen on Monday making preparations ahead of Idalia's landfall. People in Tampa were seen filling up sandbags at a distribution point. School districts across the region cancelled classes starting on Monday afternoon. Tampa International Airport said it would suspend commercial operations starting Tuesday. At a gas station in Gainesville, people gathered emergency supplies. Some were seen filling up jerry cans of fuel, while things like bottled water quickly sold out. A four-hour failure of the UK's main air traffic control system has interrupted or cancelled the travel plans of an estimated 200,000 people around the world. Airlines are struggling to recover from the disruptions with many cancelling their flights. After a long wait on the tarmac, Unfortunately, the flight has been cancelled. Passengers are told they're not going anywhere. Now I've got the logistical nightmare of figuring out how to get you all off the aircraft and your bags, etc. Scenes like this playing out on planes across the UK and Europe. We're just sitting on the plane hoping something good will happen. And flight radar is saying that our flight is cancelled, but we're on it. Travel grinding to a halt on one of the busiest long weekends of the year as an air traffic control glitch causes a system meltdown in airports across Great Britain. It's carnage. There is a queue for the airline information desk that's about a mile long. Bearing in mind nobody at the airline information desk has any information. Crowds at London's Gatwick look for guidance. Because their systems are down, they don't know which flights have been cancelled, so they won't release us. This employee ripping up a list of scheduled flights. What's happened is that the automated systems have failed and therefore uh, procedures are having to be carried out manually. Which meant only a limited number of planes could take off or land. More than 3,000 flights were due to leave the UK on Monday, another 3,000 due to arrive. Thousands of flights were delayed and hundreds cancelled. The impact extending to airports around the world, affecting hundreds of thousands of passengers. After several hours, engineers identified and remedied the technical issue. There's no indication this was the result of a hack, more likely some sort of IT failure. Now, a U.S. district judge has scheduled Donald Trump's D.C. trial on charges of attempting to overturn the 2020 presidential election for March 2024. At a separate hearing in Atlanta, Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, has been testifying for hours about Trump's efforts to reverse Joe Biden's victory in Georgia. The purpose of that hearing is to see if Meadows can move his state-level indictment to federal court. 
less than a week after he was indicted on charges of trying to overthrow the results of the 2020 presidential election, Donald Trump was set a date for his trial. The former president's legal team had argued that a trial in 2026 would be necessary given the vast number of documents to process. That would have been 18 months after the 2024 election. Judge Tanya Chutkin disagreed, saying there was no basis for delaying the trial so long. She did, however, put the trial back two months from the requested date to March 4th, 2024. It's bad timing for Trump, but the court case may not harm his electoral chances. He continues to lead by a long stretch the field for the Republican nomination. Trump wasted no time in replying on his social media platform Truth Social. He once again decried a witch hunt against him and accused Chutkin of being a biased Trump-hating judge. He vowed to appeal, even though one is not possible, before a verdict is handed down. Donald Trump will have another day in court later the same month with his trial in New York, where he faces charges of paying hush money to adult film star Stormy Daniels. He also faces two other criminal cases for fomenting an insurrection in Washington on January 6, 2021 and of mishandling classified documents. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. Now, the Taliban has tightened their grip around its female population once again with new restrictions. The militant group has now posed new curbs on women's education and movements. The Taliban have banned women from visiting one of Afghanistan's most popular national parks, adding to a long list of restrictions aimed at shrinking women's access to public places. The ban was announced after the acting minister of Vice and Virtue complained that women visiting the park had not been adhering to the proper way of wearing the hijab. Moreover, Mohammad Khalid Hanafi stated that going sightseeing was not a must for women. As he asked security forces to begin stopping women from entering into the park, Human Rights Watch described the ban as the latest in a growing list of restrictions imposed on Afghan women. Since the Taliban returned to power in 2021, authorities have closed most girls' secondary schools, barred women from university and stopped many female Afghan and staff from working. A raft of public places, including bathhouses, gyms and parks, have also been made off-limits for women. Amid tensions on the Korean Peninsula, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un called for his navy to ramp up war readiness and said it will become part of the regime's nuclear deterrent. Kim also criticized Seoul, Washington and Tokyo for their plans to hold trilateral military drills. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un criticized the leaders of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan for their plans for trilateral joint military drills. According to the regime's state-run media on Tuesday, Kim Jong-un marked the day of Navy by inspecting the naval headquarters near Pyongyang with his daughter. In a ceremonial speech there, Kim mentioned the Camp David Trilateral Summit where Seoul, Washington and Tokyo pledged to regularize joint military exercises. During the speech, Kim referred to South Korea by using the country's full name for the first time. He also called the Korean Peninsula the, quote, most dangerous zone for nuclear war, citing Washington's deployment of strategic assets in the South. He urged Pyongyang's Navy to brace for any possible warfare at all times. Kim called for Navy's overwhelming and preemptive offensive against any unexpected conflict, while promising it, quote, will be provided with new means of arms and will be a component of the state nuclear deterrent. The regime's leader also presented some of the strategies for the Navy to get into a stronger position than its enemy so that it could control the state of war. Meanwhile, Kim's appearance with his daughter in the media was the first in 100 days since when Kim was monitoring the preparation for the spy satellite launch on May 16th. Also following Kim on Monday were the vice chairman of the Central Military Commission of the Northeast ruling Workers' Party, Lee Byung-chul, and Defense Minister, Kang Sun-nam. It was the first time that Kim Jong-un has visited the naval headquarters for the Day of Navy since he took power in 2012. No heed for ultimatums, as President Emmanuel Macron has said that France's ambassador to Niger will stay in the Sahel country, despite pressure to leave from the leaders of a recent coup. He also reiterated France's support to Niger's overthrown President Mohamed Bazoum, whose decision not to resign Macron called courageous. Macron also said Paris would support any military action by the economic community of West African states in Niger. 
France's ambassador will remain at his post in Niger. This was the message from President Macron after Paris passed the 48-hour deadline for its ambassador to leave the country, an ultimatum laid out by Niger's coup leaders on Friday. Thanking the efforts by French diplomats in Niamey, Macron reaffirmed his support to the country's ousted president Mohamed Bazoum. I believe our policy is the correct one. It's based on the courage of President Bazoum, on the efforts of our diplomats and our ambassador in Niger, who will stay despite pressure from coup leaders. We do not recognize them. We support the president, who's not resigned. Macron defended France's military presence in Niger, stating that without French intervention, the country, along with neighboring Mali and Burkina Faso, would no longer exist. If France hadn't intervened, if our soldiers hadn't fallen in Africa, if Operation Serval, then Barkhane, had not been carried out, we would not be talking today about Mali, Burkina Faso or Niger. Those states would no longer exist today with its existing borders. The comments come as anti-France tensions have been simmering in Niger. Tens of thousands rallied over the weekend in support of last month's coup, demanding the departure of French troops and accusing Paris of interfering in their affairs. Meanwhile, Niger's junta leader has ordered the Nigerian armed forces to go on maximum alert over foreign threats to restore constitutional order, while the West African bloc ECOWAS has been attempting dialogue with coup leaders while remaining on standby for possible military intervention. The junta has so far rebuffed diplomatic attempts by the bloc to reverse the coup. the latest updates ahead of the 2024 Republican primary. An Emerson College poll showed that former President Donald Trump dropped a few points after skipping the first GOP primary debate. The poll found that half of all Republican primary voters said they intended to support Mr. Trump, down from 56% in Emerson's poll ahead of the debate. The biggest increase in support was for former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley, who went from 2 to 7%, whereas Florida Governor Ron DeSantis went from 10 to 12%, and former Vice President Mike Pence went from 3 to 7%. Emerson found that while 27% of voters said entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy won the debate, his support went from 10 to 9%. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden is seen as old and confused, while Mr. Trump is seen as corrupt and dishonest. A damning poll has shown ahead of what is likely to be a rematch between them in 2024. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A live wriggling worm which was found in a woman's brain in Australia in a world's first phenomenon was described by an infectious diseases physician as something he never expected. The worm is usually found in pythons and had not been documented in humans before. Medical staff at King Hussein Cancer Centre in Jordan operated a robotic surgery on a cancer patient providing a more accurate performance. King Hussein Cancer Centre's thoracic surgery consultant stated that the robotics operations were proven to lessen the pain on patients with smaller wounds and faster recovery from the surgery. The Pakistan High Court suspended former Prime Minister Imran Khan's prison sentence for a graph conviction. Nonetheless, it remains unclear whether he will be immediately released. A faculty member at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill was shot dead on campus on Monday, and campus police stated that a suspect was taken into custody. The Indian Space Agency released new images of Chandrayaan 3's rover Pragyan's latest findings on the surface of the lunar south pole. The mission had been endowed with several experimentations, of which a thermal readings of the lunar surface have been sent across to ISRO. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight in Narok, Kenya, in the midst of the mesmerizing Maasai culture. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.